Hello, everyone. My name is Dean Atta. I'm working as a petroleum engineer at Khalda Petroleum Company. I'll be your moderator today. I want, I want to welcome all of you for this session, and I want to welcome Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed al garhi who will be our presenter today. Uh, so let me introduce him to you. Dr. Ahmed al garhi is the director of the Biopetro uh, non-profit educational project. Also, he is assistant professor at Merita College, Ohio, USA, where he teaches production and completion geomechanics and unconventional reservoir and evaluation de and development. He holds a PhD and a master's degree in petroleum engineering from Texas Tech University. Dr. al garhi has over 11 years of experience focusing on hydraulic fracturing, geomechanics, and unconventional reservoir evaluation and development, and he, he has he has worked for Advantic International, OGS, Khalda Petroleum Company, Texas Tech University, and the Salman Associate. Dr. El Garhi published many journals and research papers with Elsevier, SPE, Paula, and Aroma. In addition, he filed two US patents. Uh, patent applications to increase hydrocarbon recovery in both, uh, in both conventional and unconventional reservoirs. Uh, so I hope you, all of you, to enjoy our session today. So Dr. Ahmed, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you today <clears throat> as an instructor, not as a moderator or organizer for the uh, webinars. So at the beginning, <clears throat> you see, uh, Four of my students here in Marietta College riding uh, a sucker road pump. You know, sucker road pump, we use sucker road pump to get oil from underground, but there is some other uses for sucker road pump, like getting pictures when you graduate. It is a joke. You know, we don't advise students to, uh, you know, get pictures like this because it is not safe for them. So um, today, the lecture will be about introduction to hydraulic fracturing. I know many of you right now asking themselves that we get many lectures about hydraulic fraction. So what is special about this lecture? In this lecture, I will be focusing on the basics, very basic stuff. So if you have a, a study in geology or chemistry or mechanical engineering, you know, uh, it, it is your chance now to um, learn the concept of hydraulic fraction. Why hydraulic fracturing is something good, is something we like to do in oil and gas, so um, uh, I wish you would get something valuable today. So uh, let's get a start. So today I will tell you something about what is formation damage. What is well stimulation? Remember, it is not simulation. It is stimulation, OK? I will tell you something about what is hydraulic fracturing, why we do hydraulic fracturing, something very quick about hydraulic fracturing operation, and something very quick about uh, fracturing mechanics. So before we start, let's play this game together. We know that we have a doctor, look to the pointer. We have a doctor, and for sure we have a patient. If there is no patient, there is nothing the doctor will do, right? And the patient, for sure, he get a disease. And that disease has symptoms and diagnosis. Also, we have a medicine for the disease. OK, let me give you an example. Uh, think about COVID-19, the new coronavirus we have these days. OK, so imagine there is someone get the coronavirus. So he's a patient. And the disease name is uh, COVID-19 or, you know, um, uh, new coronavirus and the symptoms i believe everybody right now know what is the symptoms of covid-19 like um, uh, dry coughing fever sometimes we lose the ability to smell and taste um, uh, and there is a medicine so there is some you know countries use some medicines you know we we know that we don't have a vaccine yet for covid-19 and we don't have uh, you know, a good medicine for COVID-19 right now, but we still use some medicines, okay? So we are a petroleum engineers. Most of us, we are petroleum engineers who are in our way to work for oil and gas companies. So the doctor here will be the petroleum engineer. The patient in our case will be the reservoir. Maybe your reservoir will be the patient. What does that mean? 
you are expecting that reservoir to produce 2,000 barrels a day, but today it produced only 1,000. So the reservoir is kind of sick, is a patient, okay? So we need to figure out what is the disease, why that reservoir is not producing like we are expecting, okay? So for you as a petroleum engineer, you need to figure out what is the disease facing your reservoir, the oil or gas reservoir. And also you need to figure out what is the symptoms, how you know that the reservoir has exact problem. Okay, and at the end, I need you as a petroleum engineer to tell me what should be a good medicine or a good remedy for that case. Okay, so we will play this game together today. So. I helped you to, um, uh, I told you the doctor will be the petroleum engineer, the patient will be the, uh, your reservoir, but I will not tell you who is the disease and who is the, what is the symptoms and what is the medicine. You will help me figure out that. Good deal? So let's start the game. Okay, so I will tell you something about formation damage. Formation damage simply is something damaging your permeability. We have a, a oil or gas reservoir. That reservoir has pores, which is the location of the oil and gas and water. But these pores need also to have something we call permeability. Permeability is the ability of how easy these fluids move inside the reservoir, from the reservoir to the wind pool. So I can produce it. So the formation damage is anything mechanically or chemically that damage that permeability, damage that ability for that oil and gas to get produced, okay? So the formation damage, is it a disease or what? What do you think? Formation damage is a disease or symptoms or a medicine. I uh, hear some of you saying formation damage Based on my definition, it should be a disease, right? So the formation damage occurs in all type of formation. Maybe it occurs in um, carbonate formations. Maybe it occurs with sandstone formation, whatever formation. And I can figure out it is a formation damage by noticing there's a loss of well performance. The well is not producing as usual. I used to get 2,000 barrel from that well every day. But today, it is only 1,000. Today, it is only 1,500. So I noticed there was a sudden uh, decrease. So I scratch my head and say, hey, maybe this is a formation damage. And also maybe something else. It is the same like when you go to see a doctor and the doctor asking you, what do you feel? You tell him, hey, I have a headache. I have a fever. I have this and this and this. And the doctor has a big list of diseases. So a good doctor, based on the symptoms you tell him, and whenever he, check, uh, uh, he checks your body, he will tell you exactly what kind of disease you have. Then he writes you the right medicine. So, and this is exactly what you are trying to do now. You are trying to figure out if, if it is uh, a formation damage disease or fines immigration disease or something else then you can decide what should be a good medicine for that case, okay? So the formation damage will plug the poor throat. So there is no permeability or there is a decline in the permeability. The ability of that reservoir to produce will be less. It, it may occur anytime, anytime during the reservoir life. Also, it may change the wettability. You know, a good reservoir should be water wet, so the water will like to stay inside the reservoir and the oil will like to get out of the reservoir and get produced. So maybe by mistake, you inject something to your reservoir and that something, that chemical will change the wettability. Change the wettability and instead of having a reservoir water wet, it become oil wet. So the reservoir like to keep the oil inside and kick out and produce the water. And we are not working to produce water. We are working to produce oil and gas, right? This is why they call us petroleum engineers, not water engineers, okay? Um, 
it can um, uh, take various periods of time. Also, it can be simple or a combination of different types of formation damage. So maybe it is a one reason, maybe it is multiple uh, reasons. Okay, and you as a doctor or a petroleum engineer, you need to figure out uh, what is going on in your reservoir. Something very generic, it is always better to avoid than to treat. It is always better to avoid coronavirus to, uh, you know, better than uh, getting the virus and think about what should be the treatment. So please try to avoid uh, anything bad, anything will harm your health, and it is better than, you know, uh, getting the disease and try to figure out what should be a good medicine for you. Okay, so it is the same for formation damage. Okay. Okay. How to identify? How to know that I have um, uh, a formation damage? I notice there is a loss of well performance. The well bore is not producing as usual. Also, I can use PLT. PLT is production uh, logging tool. If you remember the uh, lecture by um, uh, you know engineer Maria about case hole logging, she told us something about product production logging tools. So I can use production logging to identify uh, uh, if there is any lack of, of you know, decline in the performance or if, if I'm producing more water than expected, I can use PLT to figure out exactly what is going on inside my well pool. Also, I can get a sample and that sample may tell me something, hey, you have uh, the type of bacteria is, you know, uh, SRV, for example, or you have something of, you have a scale problem. Okay. Also, I can send a downhole video camera, which is you know kind of expensive, but you know it's still something doable, and we can do that. So this is a list of things we can do to identify what is the reason of um, that production decline. Okay, and maybe it is a formation damage problem. Okay, so here is a problem I'm facing. I say it is a formation damage problem, but there is no way to quantify how big or how severe is that formation damage problem. I need a measure. I need something to tell me that formation damage is too much or too small, too big or too small. Okay, so we invented a mathematical model we called skin factor. The skin factor, whenever it gets positive value like plus two plus five plus ten plus one hundred it means your formation is damaged if it is high value it means it is more damage if it is zero it means there is no damage at all the formation is okay if it is negative it means that reservoir is stimulated stimulate means hydraulic fracturing acidizing or acid fracturing it is like you, are, you have a good health, but you are going to the gym to build better and bigger muscles. You, you are not facing any problems, but you want to get, uh, you know, you get some vitamins, you go to the gym, you, you do bodybuilding to get better uh, shape and better uh, muscles. So this is when we get a negative skin. It means your reservoir producing more than expected. Okay? So... Here is the model I'm using. S is a skin. K is the permeability of the reservoir. Ks is the permeability of the damaged zone. The near well bore zone that get damaged by any mechanical reason or any chemical reason. And I told you before, formation damage is damaging the permeability something happens that makes that reservoir is not or that well not producing as we want or as we expect and here is the you know uh, the natural logarithm and here is our s the radius of the you know um, uh, damaged zone and here is our w the radius of the your your well pool. so i use this mathematical simple mathematical equation we call it hawkins formula to identify if there is a formation damage or not okay Okay, so types of formation damage. It may be mechanical, 
like solids invasion, when we drill, we use drilling fluids. If you remember the lecture by, you know, uh, uh, chemist Marwa, when she told us something about the drilling fluids, the drilling fluids will invade the reservoir for um, uh, a short distance deep inside the reservoir. And also whenever we do a workover job, the workover fluid, which is mo most likely water and, and KCL, will invade the reservoir and make, you know, a, a zone of damaged zone, okay? Maybe emulsion, maybe water blockage, all of these things we call it mechanical factors. We have also chemical factors, which is uh, a chemical reaction, that chemical reactions lead to, leads to uh, a precipitate inside the formation. So maybe it is a chemical reaction, and because of that reaction, we get a precipitation, some solids precipitate inside the formation and blocked the force roads and stopped or you know lowered the permeability. Okay. Also, it may be fines migration, and I will tell you exactly what is fines migration. Just wait for a couple of minutes. Okay. Also, it may be a bacteria problem. Okay. So we categorize all of them under mechanical or chemical factors. Okay, what is fines migration? Fines migrations, whenever any solids inside your reservoirs moves from a location inside your reservoir to another location inside the reservoir also. So it is not produced. Of the, if these solids, if it is clays or, you know, uh, sand particles or whatever, it, it is moving from a location inside the reservoir to another location and not produced at all. And during the movement, it may stuck in a fourth throat and block uh, a pass for the permeability for the fluid. So we call that problem fines migration. And it is uh, common to happen in sandstone formation. Okay, so if these particles get produced, I will not call it fines immigration. I will call it sand production. So if I ask you this question, what is the difference between fines immigration and sand production? You should tell me these solids inside the reservoir, which is maybe quartz, maybe clays, maybe whatever, moves from a, from a location to another location inside the reservoir and not produced, not reaching the well bore and get to the surface. I would call that fines migration. Okay, if it is get produced, I will call it now sands production, not fines migration. Okay, I wish this uh, should be clear to you. Okay, so back to uh, our game we have today. So, what kind of diseases we talked about now? We talked about formation damage, it is a disease. We talked about fines migration. It is a disease. Okay. What should be the symptoms? Decline in production, sudden decline in production. What should be diagnosis? How to identify what is going on? I can use a PLT. I can do, you know, any kind of, you know, uh, the analysis. I can send uh, a video camera. I can get a sample or whatever. So this kind of, uh, ways to diagnose the problem okay uh, what should be a medicine we did not mention any medicine or remedy yet okay so just wait okay now let me tell you something about what is well stimulation okay well stimulation you know the la in the in the english language the word stimulate means to make something better so if you want to stimulate the economy in your country, you want to make your, the economy in your country better, okay? If you want to stimulate the oil production, you want to make it better. You are producing 2,000, but I want to make it 3,000. I want to make it 4,000. So if you succeed to do that, it means you did well stimulation, okay? So the well stimulation is a well intervention uh, technique we do to increase the uh, oil or gas uh, production, okay? So what is 
categorized under well stimulation. Maybe hydraulic fracturing will increase the productivity. Maybe acidizing, this will increase the productivity. And we get a lecture by Dr. Ahmed Goma about uh, you know, uh, acidizing. And maybe acid fracturing. So whenever you inject to your reservoir and that injection rate or injection pressure lower than the pressure that break down your reservoir, that fracture your reservoir, that crack your reservoir, I will call that a fracturing injection, okay? If you are injecting below that pressure and you are not parting your formation, you are not breaking your formation, I will call it matrix injection because you are injecting to the uh, rock matrix. No, you are not breaking down the, or, you know, fracking or fracturing that rock. Okay, so acidizing, if it is below the fracturing pressure, I will call it acidizing. If it is higher than the fracturing pressure, I will call it acid fracturing, very simple. So these three things, hydraulic fracturing, acidizing, and acid fracturing, the, the group of these uh, three, I call them well stimulation, techniques to improve the productivity of your well. Okay, so, I think we mentioned something now about the medicine of remedy. So the hydraulic fracturing, the acidizing, the acid fracturing may be a medicine, a good medicine or a good remedy for formation damage problem, right? Yes, true. But remember, maybe you are not facing any formation damage and you still like to do hydraulic fracturing to increase the productivity more than uh, normal. Okay, okay. Let me tell you what is hydraulic fracturing. Okay, so simply the hydraulic fracturing, I'm injecting fluid from the surface. We call it engineered fluid. What is the meaning of engineered fluids? It means there is a recipe. Whenever you cook something in the kitchen, you have a recipe for the food you are doing. And exactly we have the same thing whenever we prepare the uh, frac fluid, there is a recipe. We know that should be uh, fresh water plus some chemicals. You know, on each chemical, we should add exact amount. So if you do it this way, we call it engineered fluids. And we pump these fluids in a high rate that can build up pressure, downhold pressure, exceeds the breakdown pressure. Then you, boom, crack the formation, break it down then you start having many cracks inside your formation. So there is a big pass for the fluid, for the hydrocarbon to come, to come back to the wood bore and get produced, right? Okay, there's a problem. Whenever you stop pumping, the fracture you created will get closed again. And it ends up to nothing. It will not produce anything extra. So I need to have something keeps this fracture open. What can make that fracture open? This powder, look to the camera, see this powder? We call it sand, also we call it purple. I have many different colors. Look at this one also, different sizes, different colors by different companies. So these sands will get injected with that frac fluid and stay inside the fracture. And whenever you stop injecting, the fracture will try to close and the propane will stay inside, keeping that fracture open, making the pass for the hydrocarbon uh, open to flow uh, in a higher rate from the formation to your wool bore and to the surface, okay? So simply, this is what is hydraulic fracturing. So we do hydraulic fracturing for low permeability reservoirs because we know that low permeability will not produce that much and we wanna get more production. So we like to do it for low permeable reservoirs. Okay, but I have a question here. What about high permeable reservoirs? Just, I will answer that very uh, soon. Okay, so look to the picture here. This is a vertical well, look to the mouse. 
the point. This is the vertical well, and I have here a perforation. Here is my reservoir. I perforate, then inject in a high rate. Then I break down the formation. I inject the propent. The propent will stay inside the formation. Then after I finish pumping, I will open the well for production, and I will get more and more and more production data. Look to this well, look to the pointer again. If this is a horizontal well, this is a horizontal lateral inside the reservoir. And there is no way to fracture all the horizontal lateral at one time, because the lateral is too long, maybe 5,000 feet, maybe 7,000 feet, maybe more. So there is no way to fracture all of it uh, at one time. So I fracture it in stages, like a short, uh, you know, uh, distance, like for, let's say 100 feet, then the next 100 feet or whatever. And we get more information about that in the lecture and the webinar of uh, Aaron uh, Barton, when he talked to us about uh, multi-stage fracturing. Okay, so I have two ways. If you have a vertical well, this is the way we do it. If you have a horizontal well, which is now more common, this is the way we do it. We do it step by step. For the high permeable reservoir, you may tell me my well is producing very good, excellent, and there is no need. I don't want to produce anymore. But sometimes if you have a friable formation or, you know, as a low youngest modulus, like in Gulf of Mexico, the sands in Gulf of Mexico, or maybe in, let's say, in, in some deep water projects, we produce a lot of sands. And these sands, when, whenever it get produced with um, uh, oil and gas, it will damage the, the tubing, it will damage the surface facilities. So I can make hydraulic fractures, short ones and fat ones. We call it short and fat, which is frac and pack technique. The name, the commercial name is frac and pack, which is a short hydraulic fracture and fat hydraulic fracture. And the objective is to stop sand production. So it is not to increase uh, oil productivity or gas productivity. It is to stop sand production. So if I ask you this question, what about do we do hydraulic fracturing for high permeable reservoirs? The answer is yes, if we are facing a sand production problem. We use it for sand control. OK? OK, I wanted to watch this video very quick. Please watch the video. And you know what? We will, you know, it is like a two minutes video. In order to maximize the production potential of the well, the shale formation will be hydraulically fractured. In preparation for the fracturing process, the casing will be perforated in the horizontal portion of the well using tubing conveyed perforating guns containing explosive charges. The perforated intervals are spaced approximately 50 to 80 feet apart and create a connection between the production casing and the shale formation. With the initial perforating complete, the tubing and perforating guns are pulled to the surface and the workover rig is replaced by a hydraulic fracturing crew consisting of a number of high pressure pumps and blending equipment. This equipment will pump a mixture of water and propent, usually sand, through the newly created perforations in the production casing and into the shale formation. First, water is passed from a water storage impoundment into the blue working tanks depicted on this location. The water is then pulled into a hydration unit which provides the ability to gel the fluid before it is transferred to the blender. At the blender, propent and a small amount of chemicals that aid in the fracturing process are added. The blender transfers the fluid and propent mixture to the pump trucks through the low pressure side of the manifold. The fracturing pumps increase the pressure of the fluid, sending it back through the high pressure side of the manifold to the fractory where it enters the well. The entire fracturing process is controlled from the treatment monitoring van. When the fracturing fluid reaches the perforations, pressure builds until the shale formation fractures, allowing fluid to enter into the formation. Additional fractures are created along natural zones of weakness in the shale. These fractures are contained within the shale formation, well below the ground. After an initial stage of fluid called the pad is pumped to create a fracture area, Propent is added to the fluid and is distributed throughout the newly created fracture network. 
At the conclusion of the fracturing treatment, the prompent allows the fractures to remain open so that the natural gas can flow into the production casing and to the surface. This completes the first of several stages in the fracturing process. This process is repeated by lowering and pumping down an isolation plug and perforating guns into the well bore to complete the next stage of fracturing. This time, the tools are conveyed into the well by a wireline unit which allows the fracturing process to proceed much faster and more efficiently. A lubricator is used to control the pressure of the well while the operation is taking place. On the bottom of the perforating gun, a composite bridge plug is placed to isolate the newly fractured zone. This ensures that the subsequent fracturing treatment is contained in the current zone. The perforating gun is again fired at roughly 50 to 80 foot intervals, creating a connection between the production casing and the shale formation. The fracturing process is then repeated until all of the stages are completed. A typical shale well has approximately 8 to 12 stages of fracturing. At the conclusion of the fracturing operations, the isolation plugs are removed from the well and production can start. The produced fluids are diverted through a flowback manifold into storage tanks. The fluids are then recycled or disposed of according to state and federal regulations. Okay, so if you need more information about uh, the operation, please watch the two uh, webinars by engineer Yusuf uh, Al Waziri. Also watch the webinar by uh, you know engineer uh, Ellen uh, Bat. Okay, about the multi-stage uh, fracturing. Okay, so let me simplify what is exactly happening. Look here, this is the time in the x-axis. This is the time, and this is the bottom hole pressure. Whenever we start injecting, now you inject the uh, fluid, which is most most of it is water plus some uh, chemicals. W whenever you start pumping, the pressure will keep increasing. Let me try to. Uh, Point to option. Okay, so the pressure, the bottom hole pressure will keep increasing, 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 increasing until boom, breakdown here. Now we fracture the formation. This is the breakdown pressure. Then it will move like this, it will behave like this, most likely. Whenever you stop pumping, look here, the injection rate, we stopped injecting. We stopped injecting here. So we get that pressure, we call it the caution pressure. Here is the ISIP, instantaneous shutting pressure. And during that period from here to here, the fracture is still open. The fracture is still open because it was wide because of the, uh, you know, the, in the frac fluids inside it, okay? And by the way, whenever I say open, maybe it is two millimeters. So it, is, it doesn't mean too wide. It is like maybe one millimeter or two millimeters. That's it, okay? For starting from this point to the end, now the fracture is closed. So this part of the well test analysis, if you remember the lectures by Dr. Mehdi Azari, this part, whenever I do the well test analysis, for example, this is a reservoir dominated. Why? Because the fracture already closed. But if you want to do analysis from this point to not to the, this is a mistake, it should be to this point from here to here, this should be a uh, fracture dominated. Okay, so this is simplifying how the pressure behave inside whenever we do hydraulic fracturing, growing to the breakdown pressure, then when here we stop pumping, here the fracture will get closed to the end. Okay. So let's move on. Okay, now let me list for you what should be the applications for hydraulic fracturing. We use hydraulic fracturing for to increase the production rate, to enhance the production rate, make the rate, the production better. We use it as a sand control. You remember for high permeable formation, the short and fat fracture, like what we do in Gulf of Mexico, for example. So this is also application of hydraulic fracturing. Also in water flooding, we fracture our wells unintentionally. Unintentionally. Unintentionally means that 
I'm designing these wells to not be fractured, but over time, the formation get cooling down, cooling down, cooling down, because I'm injecting water from the surface, and that water is, uh, you know, colder than the formation uh, temperature. So over time, the breakdown pressure of the reservoir will become less and less and less until it gets fractured unintentionally during the water flooding project, okay? Also, we use hydraulic fracturing in disposal injection, like injecting drill cuttings but using hydraulic fracturing or injecting produced water or any other waste material using hydraulic fracturing. I will do my best to get you someone uh, give you a webinar about disposal injection using hydraulic fracturing because it is a very interesting topic. Okay. Okay. So now tell me something about the medicine. The medicine may be hydraulic fracturing. The medicine may be, may be acidizing. The medicine may be uh, acid fracturing. And you, the one who decide what should be the best medicine for that case. Okay, so you need to collect all the information about your reservoir, about the case, about the, the disease, and at the end, you decide what should be a good treatment. Okay? Okay, why we do hydraulic fracturing? Why it works? Why it is, it is increasing the production? Let's see. Okay. I know many of you know this uh, gentleman, you know, you know his name, but maybe you don't know his picture. This is Henry Darcy, the one who developed uh, uh, Darcy equation, or we, we, uh, we call it Darcy Law, okay? So Darcy Law, that guy, that French guy, long, long time ago in the 18th century, he was a, a civil engineer and he was trying to design a fountain in a, in a place near Paris in France, okay? So he found, he did some experiments because he wanna do a fountain and he gets that you know, equation. Q, which is a production rate or injection rate, and K is the permeability of the formation, A is the cross section, and this is uh, the pressure, the, like the uh, drawdown pressure, BP and PA, the, the, different, the pressure difference between point A and point B. And here is mu is the viscosity and here's the lens of the uh, tube he used to do his experiment, okay? So simply, if I'm increasing the thickness area of that uh, pipe, the production will increase or not? You will tell me this is very straightforward, yes. If I'm creasing the cross section, if I, instead of having this pipe, I will get a, a bigger pipe, it will get uh, more water or more oil, right? If I'm creasing the permeability of the reservoir, it will get more oil or more water, more liquid, more fluid, okay? If I increase the drawdown pressure, the difference between this, the pressure between these two points, I will get more fluid. If you increase the viscosity, you will get a decline in the production. If you get longer pipe, you will get a decline in the production. But forget about all of these things, just to focus about the cross-section area. Focus about this one, okay? Because whenever we do a hydraulic fracturing, I am increasing the contact area with the reservoir. And as you see from this equation, whenever you increase the contact area between the well and the reservoir, look, here is the area. If you increase this A, you will increase Q. Very simple, very straightforward. Okay, look, this is a vertical well. What is the contact area between the well and the reservoir? Here is the reservoir. The contact area is this cylinder, cylindrical shape here. Okay, here is the contact area. You can get the, you know, uh, you can calculate it very simply. The intersection between this uh, uh, well and the formation here. This is a horizontal well. Which one has more contact area with the reservoir? This one or this one? Very simple. You will tell me the horizontal well has more contact area with the reservoir. This is why it produces more. So horizontal well will produce more oil and gas and water more than the vertical well. Okay, 
What about if I get that horizontal well and I added hydraulic fractures here? Now you are increasing the contact area between the well bore and the reservoir more and more and more. So you are producing more fluids from your reservoir. If you fracture this vertical well, now you are increasing the contact area between the reservoir and that well bore. So a fractured vertical well will produce better than a vertical well without any hydraulic fractures. Very simple. So whenever I'm asking you why hydraulic fracturing is good, you should tell me hydraulic fracturing increase the contact area between the reservoir and the well bore. That's it. Thank you. Okay. So also we mentioned something before in other lectures about fracture conductivity. Right now, whenever I do hydraulic fracturing, I am increasing, I am uh, creating a very conductive surface inside the well, inside the reservoir. Look, that fracture is wide, maybe one millimeter wide, maybe two millimeter wide. And that permeability of the propane, this is a propane, is very, very high compared with the reservoir permeability. So you are creating a very conductive uh, surface inside your reservoir. And the fluid, whenever it reach this wing at any point, it goes immediately to the well bore. This is the well bore. I'm looking from the top. Okay, this is the well bore. This is the two wings of the hydraulic fracture. So the fracture conductivity is the fracture width times the fracture conductivity, the fracture permeability, which is uh, a good measure of how good is your fracture. Okay, let's talk about something else. We are we're still talking about why hydraulic fracturing is good because hydraulic fracturing can bypass the damage. Let me tell you this example. Imagine you live in a big city, whatever your country, and you are trying to go through the main square in, in that city. If I'm living in Cairo, Egypt, for example, and I wanna go during the rush hour uh, and I wanna pass the uh, Tahrir Square, for example, it is very, very crowded area. So it may take two, three hours, you know, in traffic, jams and you know I'm waiting and there's a, a crowd of cars, I will lose a lot of time. And instead of going through that crowded square, if I go through a highway, no traffic jam, no stops, all cars moving very fast, I can reach uh, you know my target very, very quickly in a very short time. So now we are comparing if the oil or gas moving from the reservoir through that damaged zone here and here. This is very crowded, like you have a lot of cars stopping in front of you. Some of them is not moving. Some of, some of them, you know, uh, you know, broke down. So there's a lot of problems. So you cannot reach the whirlpool. These fluids cannot get produced. But whenever I create a hydraulic fracture, this is a hydraulic fracture. This is a one wing. This is a second wing of the hydraulic fracture. So the fluid go to that wing, which is very high conductive because there's a propent inside it and it is open. It goes immediately using the highway to the whirlpool. Easy? I think so. Okay, so hydraulic fracturing can help me bypass the formation damage. I can go to that formation damage using the highway, not the downtown, okay? Okay, let me tell you something very quick about hydraulic fracturing operation. I know that you get many lectures about that, but I will focus on some basic stuff. Okay, so here is a frac location, and I believe you watched this many times with engineer Yusuf uh, El Waziri. Uh, and we have pumps, we have tanks, we have manifolds, we have frac head, we have free savers, we have blenders, we have, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, data vans and a lot of things. But let me ask you this question. Look to this place. Here is a pumps. And here is a blender, you know, and, you know, hydration units. And where is the wellhead? Can you figure out where is the wellhead? If 
you check, this is one row of pumps, a second row, there's a manifold in the middle, and this and there's from one side, there is a, you know, the blender. And if you go to the other side, you will reach the wheel head. Here is the wheel head. This is the wheel head. And you will see a crane here. My second question, where is our cover rig? I will give you a few seconds to think about it. Try to find where is the workover rig. Do you see it? Do you see it? There is no workover rig. I'm tricking you. Okay, so this is a workover rig. Do you see something like this in the location? No, it is just a crane. So we call this rigless operation. There is no workover rig. We use a crane. Okay, this is what we call it crane. Okay, so it was just, uh, you know, um, uh, a trick to you. Okay, okay. Uh, what should be um, the material I'm using in hydraulic fracturing? I use fresh water, a lot of fresh water. I use KCL because I, I want to stabilize the clays. I want to stop you know, clay swelling and fines migration, all, all of these kind of things. So KCL will be helpful in that. I, I may use guar if I am fracking conventional wells, conventional reservoirs, I will use a lot of guar. I use propent, a lot of propent. I use a lot of chemicals. By the way, in fracking, we have more than 500 different chemicals used. And why, this is why in Europe, in many countries in Europe, they ban fracking. They don't like fracking because they, they believe these kind of chemicals uh, will harm the environment. But this is not the case in, you know, in, uh, in places outside Europe, okay? So by the way, the, this group of equipment that can do one frac job, we call it frac fleet, frac fleet. Here is tanks, here is one row of uh, pumps, a second row of pumps, manifolds in the middle, the wheel head is here, and here is the crane. Okay, so this group, we call it frac fleet. Okay, if I ask you this question, how many fleets in, do you see in this picture? How many fleets do you see in this picture? This question is kind of confusing because you see one row of pumps here, one, a second row of pumps here. Also, we see one row of pumps here and one row of pumps here. So, if it is one well, most likely it is one frac fleet. If it is two wells, two neighbor wells, it may be one frac fleet and also maybe two frac fleets if I wanna frag them, these two wells, exactly at the same time. Sometimes we do this um, to test the behavior of the reservoir. It will produce more or not. If I ask you how much horsepower the average of each pump is like 2,000 horsepower. There are some pumps higher, there are some pumps lower, but the average is like 2,000. So you can count them and uh, you know, multiply with 2,000 and you can get an average from how, how many horsepower in this location, okay? How many blenders? Also you can you know, uh, count, you know, we have blenders here. You can check on the other side if there's any blenders or not. So maybe there is one here also. So we can count them. So this is good uh, questions to um, you know um, uh, make yourself awake. Okay, look to this picture, which is uh, kind of weird, and I will tell you why it is weird. Why two frag fleets for two neighbor wells? Okay, so look. I have two wells, two neighbor wells. Here is a well, and here is a second one. Here is a well, and here is a second one. And here is a frac fleet, and here is a second one. So two frac fleets, and I'm fracking two wells neighbor. Why is this way? In this case, I, I believe that company is um, uh, Calfrac, they were testing the behavior of fracking two neighbor wells exactly at the same time. 
you know, the lateral, the horizontal sections, they are close to each other, like 500 feet away from each other. So they are very close. And you are trying to test if we frack the two wells exactly at the same time, what should be the behavior of the reservoir? I will get, uh, you know, uh, production, uh, higher production or not. So sometimes we do some uh, crazy, you know, um, uh, scenarios just to test which one will be uh, better. Okay, look to this. Here is more than 90% of the frac fluid is just water. More than around 9% of the frac fluid of, of, of what, what is I'm injecting is sand. Sand here is propen. The nickname of propen is sand. So don't get confused. Propen, this kind of things, this powder, we call it sand or propen. Okay, so around 9% and less than 0.5% is a lot of chemicals, a lot of chemicals. Gelling agent, the scale inhibitor, pH adjusting, um, a breaker, a cross linker, iron control. And I believe we got a lot of information from uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Goma, uh, engineer Yusuf Waziri. Um, and I believe Aaron mentioned something about it also. So we should know a lot of information about what is uh, the recipe of frac fluid. Okay, okay. Here is what is what we call it guar. It is something similar to beans. Look, this is some similar to beans. And we plant this in India and maybe neighbor countries. So mainly in India. And it is a very good business in India, by the way, because India they they export uh, this kind of things to uh, all over the world. Uh, guar is, as you see, as I told you, similar to beans, and when we grind it, it will be similar to starch. And it when you uh, add it to water, it will make a jello like this after adding something we call cross linkage gel, cross linker. We add that cross linker, it makes the guar with water like jello. Okay, one more time, this is in conventional reservoirs. In shale, we don't use this recipe. We use something we call slick water. And I will tell you what is slick water, okay? I mentioned to you that propent, the fracture after you stop pumping, the fracture will close. So I need to add something that keep that fracture open. Look, the fracture stay open because of the propent. I have a question here, but maybe, you know, the color is uh, not clear. Uh, why propen in, in different sizes? Why we have different sizes of propen? Do you know why? Because the mechanical properties of the formation is different from a location to another location. For example, if you have very high youngest modulus, it means the fracture will be very narrow. So you need to have very small propen like this one. If the fracture will be wider and bigger, you can use bigger balls or bigger sands or bigger uh, propen. Okay. Okay. So the last thing for today, I want to tell you something very quick about uh, fracture mechanics. Okay. So we got many lectures about rock mechanics and hydraulic and geomechanics, but the most important thing that we have overburden stress, maximum horizontal stress, minimum horizontal stress. These three, we call them principal stresses. They are all perpendicular to each other. The good news, the overburden, this is the weight of the rock and all the time pointing to the center of the earth. So I know like your weight, your body weight pointing to the center of the earth, right? So this is the overburden, I know its direction. And there is maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress. So they are two horizontal with a you know, 90 degree between each other and both of them are horizontal. One of them higher in magnitude, we call it maximum. And then the second one is you know, lower, we call it minimum, okay? If you are studying geology, you will get three types of famous types of uh, faults. The first one, which is very common, See, the movement is downward. It means the weight, the overburden, is larger than the maximum and the minimum horizontal stress. This is why the weight pushing this rock downward. 
this is normal fault system or normal fault regime. If the minimum horizontal stress and the maximum horizontal stress larger than the overburden or the weight of the rock, you see the movement is upward. This rock is moving upward. This is, we call it uh, a reverse fault or thrust fault regime. Okay, if the overburden, its magnitude in between the maximum and minimum, we see the movement parallel to the strike slip, to the strike slip. So we call it strike slip fault regime. So they move parallel to each other. Okay, so for each one of these principal stresses, I need to get its magnitude and its direction. What is known is for the overburden, the direction is, uh, you know, perpendicular to the, you know, pointing to the center of the earth and the magnitude, I can get it by integrating the density log. So using the density log, I can get the overburden magnitude. With the maximum and minimum horizontal stress, it is a different story and I will tell you something very quick about that. Just wait. Look, for the vertical stress, I can integrate the density. For the pore pressure, I can measure the pore pressure using uh, DST, RFT. This is like, uh, you know, techniques and tools. I can measure the least principal stress or the minimum horizontal stress by doing leak of test or extended leak of test or mini frac or less circulation or ballooning. There's many, many techniques to get the magnitude of that, okay? For the maximum horizontal stress, for the maximum horizontal stress, for the magnitude, I can do Analysis of Wilbur failure. This technique done by someone called uh, Dan Moose, and he is, uh, you know, he was a student of uh, Mark Zubak, the most famous name in geomechanics. Dan Moose is like, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, six years old right now. He's not uh, young. So, um, because I, I mentioned he's a, he was a student, so maybe you think he's still, uh, you know, uh, young guy. Okay, so for the maximum horizontal stress orientation, I can use uh, dipole sonic, which is a tool, dipole sonic, a sonic tool to get the direction of the minimum and maximum. If you don't know how to get that, I can tell you, just ask me during the you know, question uh, uh, time, I can answer this question for you. Okay, and also you should know that from uh, engineer Isa Haddad lecture about mechanical earth modeling. Also, I can get the rock strength using the core tests, the logs, the cutting, the, a lot of things. Okay, look here, how to get the direction, how to get the stress direction. If I get the minimum horizontal stress direction, I will get the maximum because I know there is 90 degree between them and both of them are horizontal. For the overburden, I know it is uh, perpendicular to the earth, right? So I can use dipole sonic, I can use, um, you know, caliper log analysis, I can use image log, I can use world stress map, which is uh, a website or an institute that collecting the false direction from all over the world and draw them. If I'm working in the Western desert of Egypt or Gulf of Mexico, I will send them the location and within a few minutes, they will send me a map um, showing the directions of the faults and let's say for you know this fault for example this means this is the direction of the maximum horizontal stress okay look to this figure here here is the mud weight the mud pressure if the mud weight is too low if the mud weight is too low your wheel board during drilling will collapse will collapse in you Okay, right? If the mud weight is too high, you will fracture your formation, what we call it lost circulation. So you wanna avoid collapsing your wheel bore or getting uh, wash out or break out. And also you wanna avoid getting any, uh, you know, uh, fracking your formation uh, due to high mud weight. Okay, so you wanna stay here in the middle. You want to stay here. This is safe drilling. Okay. So if your mud weight is too low, you will get a uh, uh, break out here and here. And this line, this is the direction of the minimum horizontal stress. 
If you do caliper log, I can get the direction of minimum horizontal stress by this trick. Very simple. If you get a frac and be, you, you have image log, you will see these fractures. You will see this direction is the maximum horizontal stress. Or the right way to say it, this direction is perpendicular to the minimum stress direction, which is most likely the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. But you know, uh, this is the accurate way to say. Um, and also, again, if you want to know why it is accurate to say uh, perpendicular to the minimum horizontal stress, just ask me this question in the you know, uh, question box. Okay, so let's move to something else. I developed this horizontal well to the direction of the minimum with the direction of minimum horizontal stress, and I developed this well with the direction of the maximum horizontal stress. Which one is better? Which one is better? Do you know which one is better? This one. So you must drill your horizontal well with the direction of minimum horizontal stress. Why? Because later I will frag this well and the fractures will be perpendicular to the direction, like in this case, and the total contact area with the reservoir will be more and I will produce more. Also, I will prefer to intersect with fractures, natural fractures, which is most likely will be uh, similar to this hydraulic fractures, human created fractures, and this will get me more production. If you drill it this way, with the direction of maximum horizontal stress, it means two things. The planning guy of, of the drilling was an idiot, or he want to test something. He did that by mistake, or he want to test something. And most of the cases, you know, all over the world, we drill with minimum horizontal stress direction because fracturing, hydraulic fractures, will be perpendicular uh, to uh, this uh, direction. And I will get, uh, you know, uh, more contact area and more production. Let me ask you, which one is easier to drill? This one, that bad one is easier to drill, but it is not drilling a story. It is a well will live 50 years producing. So it is not only the production. It is not only the drilling story. So although this one is easier to drill, but it will produce very, very bad. So I need to have it this way. Okay, this one. Okay. Here is summarizing. I'm drilling with minimum horizontal stress. Here is the fractures, multi-stage fractures. I will produce more and more using this case, this scenario. Okay. One of the big problems, you know, I have like maybe you know less than ten minutes to finish. I wish you you uh, uh, did not get uh, bored. Okay. So um, I have Poisson's ratio. And it is very important to get Poisson's ratio, youngest modulus and shear modulus. Why? Because this will help me to calculate what is the minimum horizontal stress, what should be the pressure that I will break down my formation. Okay, so I need to calculate the minimum horizontal stress, which is, you know, close to the breakdown pressure, not exactly, but, you know, close. And see, there is a Poisson's ratio here. If you don't know the Poisson's ratio, this means you cannot calculate the minimum horizontal stress. Here is the overburden. Here is, you know, bytes uh, constant. You know, I, I wrote you the definition of bytes constant here, and I will share the slides with you for sure. Don't worry. And uh, you know, um, uh, we have the pore pressure. We have the tectonic. So the problem here I want to share with you that whenever you calculate the Poisson's ratio, you will get a good value for that. Whenever you calculate the shear modulus, but whenever you calculate the youngest modulus, we call it dynamic youngest modulus. How you calculate youngest modulus and Poisson's ratio? Do you remember how? Most likely, you use the sonic log data to calculate the Poisson's ratio. The uh, sonic data will give you a good value for Poisson's ratio, but it will not give you a good value for youngest modulus. The youngest models we get is, we call it dynamic. Why dynamic? Because I was using a sonic wave. 
which is very small in magnitude, but very high in frequency. We call it dynamic, okay? But whenever I get a core and I test it in the lab, in the rock mechanic lab, and I apply a force, you know, a, you know, a stress until I break it down, I call that test, this is static Young's modulus. This is, you know, static Young's modulus. What we use in hydraulic fracturing, what we use in wall booster, what we use in any project of geomechanics is a static Young's modulus, not the dynamic. So one of the big challenges to you is to convert the dynamic Young's modulus to static Young's modulus that you can use. Look, here are some questions to convert from a static to dynamic. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wait, wait. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 14, 15, 16. See, many, 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 many questions. Many, many equations. Which one is right? No one. All of them are wrong. All of them are local correlations. If I develop correlation that I'm using, local correlation that I'm using in, uh, in, uh, in Gulf of Mexico, in the United States and you know, in Mexico, I cannot use that in, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the Mediterranean. I cannot use that in Russia. I cannot use, I cannot use that in, in, you know, in, in North Sea, right? So you need to develop your own local correlation to convert from dynamic youngest models to static youngest models. And this is why engineer Isa Haddad told you, you should have an expert working in that location to support you, to give you a consultation. Because whenever you calculate the youngest models, most likely you get it wrong. And you need someone to tell you, hey, this is the range, this is the right range. Let me tell you an example. If you calculate the youngest models in Gulf of Mexico and you get it 5 million PSI without asking anyone, this is wrong. The youngest models in Gulf of Mexico should be something less than 1 million, maybe 200,000, maybe 500,000. So if you have an uh, experience in a location, you can judge uh, is it true or false, okay? And this is why we need an expert. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And your job as a frac engineer or geomechanics engineer to minimize that uncertainty, okay? Okay, so let me uh, conclude. I want you, after I finish this lecture, to know exactly what is hydraulic fracturing, what is acidizing, what is acid fracturing, and uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, do, we use, do, you, do we frack uh, permeable, high permeable formation? I, I, I told you yes, for, frack, for sand control. Also, I asked why hydraulic fracturing is very important to the United States economy. Maybe I did not mention that, but let me tell you very quick. In organic shale, shale gas and shale oil, we cannot do it economically without hydraulic fraction. So, in the United States, produce more than five or six millions of oil barrels every day from shale. So, if the United States want to ban fracking and soft fracking, they should be ready to lose uh, six million barrels of oil every day, which is no one will accept that. Okay? Can we develop uh, organic shale without? Hydraulic fracturing? For sure, no. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will be happy to receive your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, session. It's very, very, very uh, enjoyable. But I have some questions from the audience. Go ahead. Okay, uh, the first one, which is a uh, repetitive uh, question. Why the drilling in the direction of the why the drilling in the direction of the minimum horizontal stresses is easier, and if we have similar stresses regime, in which direction we will drill and frack? Okay, let me go back to the slide to uh, show you. Exactly. Look, to drill with the direction of the maximum horizontal stress is easy. You said the opposite, by the way. So this is the easy way to drill. Why? Because when you drill, you are pushing against the maximum. You are pushing against the maximum. Imagine yourself in the center of a room and there's two walls. They are pushing against, against you with, uh, let's say, a, a stress of uh, 10,000 10, PSI. And the other two, two uh, uh, walls 
pushing against you in 8,000. So there is one direction you have squeezed more from, uh, you know, um, uh, from two directions. Let me uh, stop sharing. I'm not sure if you see the camera or not, if it's clear or not. Imagine that you know, on these two sides, do you see me? Yes, yes, we are okay. okay. pushing against me from these two directions in uh, 10,000 PSI. And in the other two directions, you are pushing against me in 8,000. Which one is easier to uh, resist, the 8,000 or the 10,000? The smaller one, the 8,000. So when you drill with the direction of the maximum horizontal strength, you are pushing against the minimum. You are defeating the minimum, which is easy. So the drilling rate will be higher in this direction. Okay? But if you drill in the, with the minimum horizontal stress direction, you are pushing against the maximum. Because the maximum, look, look at the pointer. Here is the maximum pushing against you. So it is harder to drill. But after you finish drilling and you want to do fracking, fracture by nature to be perpendicular to the minimum. By nature, this is what God did, not us. So it is not our choice. It is the nature that God created. So the hydraulic fracture will be perpendicular to the minimum stress, whatever you like that or not. This one. Okay? So the total I can get many, many fractures, and the total contact area with the reservoir will be more and more, and production will be more and more. And more. I wish uh, you get that. Uh, the, the next part, and if we have a similar stresses regimes, in which direction we will drill and frag? Okay, in, at any place in the globe. First, try to figure out where is the direction of the minimum horizontal stress and use it to drill your lateral. It is different from Egypt to Saudi with Russia. It is different from a place to place. So the first question is, where is the direction of the minimum horizontal stress? Whenever you know that, and it is easy to know that, easy, just uh, you can check the near faults. If you have a fault, a fault is a, the fault is a, similar to hydraulic fracture, but big one. So the fault most likely will be uh, perpendicular to the direction of the minimum of the stress. So look to the, the normal fault direction in the map. This is the direction of the maximum of the stress. Very easy. Is it clear? If it is not clear, I can explain more. Okay. Uh, that's the second question. Um, uh, why saline water is not used for fracking? Okay, what, saline water. Okay, do you want to uh, enhance your production or damage your product? People tell me uh, I want to enhance it. I want to make it better. So saline water most likely will damage your product. Why there is very you know uh, big limitation on using saline water. Sometimes we use it in very little application, but we want to be sure that there is no uh, exact types of salts in, in this uh, saline water that may precipitate inside your uh, reservoir and damage your uh, permeability. So we are trying to stimulate your production and make it be uh, better. Uh, and saline water may be damage your permeability. This is why we like to uh, avoid it. Um, okay. Uh, the next uh, question, uh, how to determine the number of pumps required for the frag job? So this is too easy. You know, if you know exactly what should be, let's say, the reservoir depth, you know, the for pressure, you know, the, uh, let's say, um, uh, what should be the minimum horizontal stress, because we do all of these things during the design time. So if my software told me you, you have like, uh, you need uh, six pumps in the location, and this is enough, I will get eight. Take one or two, like a backup if anything happened. If the software or my calculations told me that I need, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, like uh, 20 pumps in the location, I may get uh, 22 one two, um, as a backup. So we, we do a calculation for the, uh, the pressure we need, the bottom hole pressure we need uh, during the period of injection. And we can, you know, uh, you know uh, make 
some calculations to uh, translate from, you know, uh, transfer from uh, pressure to horsepower. How many horsepower uh, you need? Uh, 2,000 horsepower, it means five pumps. So I will get six to be in the okay. system. Okay, um, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for this presentation. It's very, very enjoyable and uh, informative. And thank you all of our audience today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.